He preyed on prostitutes and those on the edge of society. In the eyes uh, of a girl in the street, he, he looks like an elderly gentleman who could be your grandfather. His victims were strangled and mutilated. His crimes confounded the police. Every time you don't get them, every day it goes by, somebody else could be dead. He terrorized an entire city. Not a whole lot of people got a whole lot of sleep at that time. And tore families apart. He took something precious away from every single one of us. This is the story of one of the most fearsome serial killers America has ever seen. This is a guy who's not crazy, he's just, just bad. Rochester lies on the banks of the Genesee River in the state of New York. It's a peaceful city and a favorite spot for fishermen, hikers and holiday makers. But like every other city in North America, Rochester has its problems. No one knows more about these than local crime reporter Corey Williams. I always tell people that I had really strange crime stories in my two years in Rochester, New York. In the late 80s, Rochester was a working class town. Some areas were pretty depressed. It was definitely a town where you really needed to know where you were at all times and where you were going and who you were with. On the banks of the Genesee River run Lake and Lyle Avenue, the heart of the city's red light district. Here, amongst the strip clubs and bars, Rochester's prostitutes ply their trade. One of Lake and Lyle's working girls is 27-year-old Dorothy Blackburn. On the 15th of March, 1988, she is working the street as usual. Hey, sexy. What are you looking for? Most of the prostitutes had pimps. But once they were picked up by John and driven away, that protection and safety net was gone. It was just them. The client pays Dorothy $20 and heads to a car park on the edge of Lake and Lyle. Whilst performing oral sex, Dorothy Blackburn bites him, drawing blood. <laughs> Sorry, baby. With Dorothy Blackburn drifting in and out of consciousness, her attacker heads to the secluded countryside by the Genesee River. People who live and do their things in the street, they do feel invincible. I can take care of myself. I'm tough. You're not so tough when there's someone who's bigger than you or someone has to drop on you. When you have somebody who's, whose hands are around your neck or if they have you trapped in a car or in a wooded area where you can't scream for help, We can scream, but nobody will hear you. The killer dumps Dorothy's body in an isolated creek. When her body is discovered a week later, there are no forensic clues and no evidence of sexual assault. The case lands on the desk of Lynn Johnson of Rochester Police. I look at every murder. I've been around for a long time, been to, oh, well over a thousand. And each one of them, you, you know, you just can't understand why somebody would do this to somebody else. The murder of a prostitute provokes little public reaction. Sometimes I don't think the average ordinary citizen really cares because it doesn't involve them. It doesn't involve 
their life and their peaceful existence. But this is not an attitude shared by the investigators of Rochester Police. If a mother of four is murdered in her own home and a prostitute is found in a, in a field, yeah, I, I think there's probably a, maybe a different attitude. But, you know, the way we look at it, it's still a human being, and we're going to do our best to solve the crime. However, the killer remains one step ahead of the police. In September 1988, local resident Hector Maldonado is searching for deposit bottles by the banks of the Genesee River. And he came across what he thought was a deer carcass uh, to begin with. And what he saw as he moved some of the leaves, that this skeleton actually had um, a tank top and uh, a pair of shorts, and uh, he, then he knew that it was human. A second body, abandoned by the Genesee River. But this body is completely decomposed. Nature does its business. Flies will attack the protein, which is like your eyes, or your nose, orifice, ears, mouth. The police immediately try to work out the identity of this victim and how she died. There was no blunt force trauma, the skull was intact, the, there was no broken bones, there was no uh, marks on the bones that would show that there was a knife, knife wound on it or bullet wounds. So all the obvious things were eliminated. The police must identify the victim before they can solve the mystery of her death. Until they do, the killer is free to strike again. September 1988, Rochester, New York. Police have a dead body on their hands. A woman found by the banks of the Genesee River. But the police need help to identify the body. They call in forensic anthropologist William Rodriguez. Without an identification of a victim, many times the crime remains unsolved. Decomposition has left virtually no forensics to work with. In a wooded and a wet environment, the body is going to decompose very rapidly because of that environment. Nonetheless, there is one critical clue to suggest how this person died. There is a small bone in the neck known as the hyoid bone. And many times in individuals that are strangled or have some type of blunt force trauma to the neck, a portion or areas of this bone are fractured. It was obvious that this individual had been strangled. By examining the skull, and estimating tissue depth, Dr. Rodriguez is able to recreate an image of the victim. It is placed in the media, whether the television, newspapers, in hopes that someone will recognize this individual. Immediately, someone does. I believe it was the next day, uh, the father calls and identifies his uh, daughter. The remains belong to 27-year-old Anna Stefan, a mother of two. She had fallen into drug addiction and prostitution after the death of her sister. She has had no contact with her father for over a year. He doesn't even know she is missing. It's not uncommon for a prostitute to go off with somebody or be strung out and be missing for days and days or weeks and then reappear on the street. Being missing is not uncommon at all. It's why people target them. And in 1988, prostitution in Rochester is a deadly game. Anna Stefan is the second woman found dead by the Genesee River. Among the city's prostitutes, a rumor spreads they are being targeted by a serial killer. But prostitutes like Patty Ives need to work. In September 1989, one year after the discovery of Anna Stephan, she takes a client to the banks of the Genesee River. 
Take it easy, baby. Don't need to play rough. You ain't seen rough lately. I know who you are. I know it's you that... Four weeks later, the remains of Patty Ives are discovered by children playing nearby. As with Dorothy Blackburn and Anna Stephan, there is little evidence of sexual assault and no forensic clues. Rochester police are alarmed that three prostitutes have been murdered in quick succession. We're thinking what, what's going on with all the prostitutes because our numbers are a little higher than they were before. One of Captain Johnson's most experienced men, investigator William Barnes, has a theory. We specialized in homicides for 13 years and uh, this was different. Uh, definitely different. Normally when we find dead girls are behind a building in a vacant lot, but these girls were trying to hide them. And it just hit me that uh, these aren't the average girls that are getting killed on Lyle Avenue. When the body came out from under the bushes and that board was on it, that's when I said, I think we have a serial killer here. And I think we have a serial killer. Initially, the police don't go public with Investigator Barnes' theory. They don't want to panic the city. But Barnes isn't the only person in Rochester who has reached this conclusion. I'd come to work at 6 a.m. for the Times Union, and there was a report that there was a body found beneath the cardboard box. Later found out it was a lady in her 20s, her name was Patricia Ives. And the police listed her death as a natural death, which got me to start thinking women in their 20s don't crawl into cardboard boxes beneath bushes and just die. Something just didn't sit right. Corey Williams decides to go down to Lake and Lyle to investigate. What he discovers astonishes him. And I was interviewing some of the working girls, some of the prostitutes, and I was speaking to one young lady, and her name was Maria Welch, and she flat out told me, there's a guy out here killing the girls. Hey, baby. Want a date? Soon, she too goes missing. It hurt to know that only a few days, a few weeks before, I had spoken to this woman. She was young. She was attractive. She didn't appear to have been out on the streets a long time. Shortly after the disappearance of Maria Welsh, another prostitute, Elizabeth Gibson, also disappears. Corey Williams decides he has enough to go to press. We ran a story in the Rochester Times Union saying the Rochester police deny a serial killer is working in the city. That night, another body was found. When the story breaks, the police are not amused. So now you're trying to concentrate on what you got to do. You got this whole media frenzy on, on the other, which was their job. I mean, that, but <laughs> we're so tied up with trying to save people's lives, we don't really have time for them. Fear settles over Rochester, and not just on Lake and Lyle. Throughout the Rochester area, even in the suburbs, parents watch their kids closer. Teenage girls typically walked in groups. It pervaded the fear, the uncertainty. Rochester police scour their records and talk to anyone suspicious. Everyone from recently paroled criminals to even those caught committing minor misdemeanors on Lake and Lyle. One of the things was uh, checking every parking ticket going back for two years that was issued in all this area. Going through everyone then running it and finding out who it is, where they live. Checking our database against them but the trail stays cold. With little to go on, Rochester police investigators Barnes and Borriello work their contacts on the street. When somebody wanted to tell us something, we sat down and listened. I think that we put trust into people, and whether they're prostitutes or whatever they are, you just got to take the time to talk to them, treat them nice, get them a coffee, whatever. 
Their open approach pays off. An older prostitute, known on the street as Barb, has some information relating to one of the missing girls, Elizabeth Gibson. I interviewed her, and she stated that she had had sex with a man who had a hatchback-type car. He said his name was Mitch. November 1989, she saw Elizabeth Gibson in the car with this person. Eleven hours later, the body of Elizabeth Gibson was found in Wayne County outside the city of Rochester. She'd been strangled and found naked. In my mind, this was the person that was too much of a coincidence. The, you know, the body was found 11 hours after she saw this Elizabeth Gibson with this Mitch. And in my mind, I said, this has got to be the killer. Now we just have to identify him. But unfortunately, Barb doesn't know Mitch's real name. And she cannot identify the exact make and model of the car. The trail goes cold. As the holiday season of 1989 approaches, the killing spree continues. The bodies of six women have been found near the Genesee River. And two women are missing. Although not all are prostitutes, they all inhabit the twilight world of Lake and Lyle. As the deaths mount, the pressure is building on Lind Johnson and his men. We're responsible for people living and dying. And every day that went by that we didn't have an answer, we knew that very well somebody else could be dying. And that's a terrible responsibility to have, particularly at one point when you don't have any idea of who you're looking for. And uh, you're working uh, around the clock, uh, trying to make things happen, sleeping on the top of your desk, never going home. Christmas was shot, Thanksgiving was shot. And fortunately, I had an understanding wife and children. With one inconclusive sighting, no forensic clues, and a city demanding answers, Captain Lynn Johnson makes a call to the FBI. There's no textbook that goes in from A to B on this one. You just got to make things happen. And by using profilers as one of those tools that we use to make things happen. In 1989, the science of behavioral profiling is in its infancy. But FBI agent Greg McCrary believes it could hold the key to identifying Rochester's serial killer. Our behavior is an external manifestation of who we are as people. The cars we drive, the clothes we wear, the way we groom, the way we comb our hair, all these things are external manifestations of who we are. All we're doing in the criminal arena is looking at the method and manner in which the crime is committed and then drawing logical inferences about that from the crime scene as to the type of individual that has, has committed the crime. In a homicide or serial murder case, the offender has to make many choices. And we're going to analyze every choice. Victim, who's the victim? Method and manner of death. Body disposal site. In other words, our job is to suggest investigative techniques and strategies that they have yet to employ. McCrary's first act is to visit the deposition sites of the bodies. The reality is offenders choose places they're comfortable and familiar with to dump bodies. If you just think about it, if you had a body to dump, where would you go? Would you go someplace you've never been and you don't know and you risk being interrupted or detected? The method of killing also strikes McCrary as significant. It wasn't a ligature strangulation, but it was some sort of intense pressure. This indicated to us this was a fairly strong guy. Slowly, a picture of the killer starts to emerge. But before Greg McCrary can get inside his mind, he dramatically raises the stakes. Rochester, New York. In the previous 18 months, six women have been killed and two... The corpses have been dumped by the Genesee River. The police have one lead. A prostitute called Barb had seen one of the victims get into a hatchback car shortly before her death. But the driver's identity remains a mystery. Then, on Thanksgiving Day, there is a dramatic and gruesome development. The body of June Stodd, who had gone missing four weeks previously, turns up by the Genesee River. She has been mutilated, cut open from the neck her navel. 
this was unusual. We hadn't seen this in any other uh, of the victims up to this point. So first thing we had to decide is, is this part of this sequence or is this something different? June Stott is not a prostitute. But like the other victims, she drifted through the twilight world of Lake and Lyle. There is no sign of sexual assault, and once again, no forensic evidence. But then, Greg McCrary notices something potentially significant. Looking at the body itself, the lividity was wrong. Lividity is how the blood settles. Uh, anytime a body dies, gravity pulls the blood down. June was on her face. Uh, yet the lividity was in her back. Uh, so anytime you have blood defying gravity, you have to pay attention. Something's wrong. McCrary concludes that the killer had returned to June Stott's body and mutilated the corpse sometime after her death. She had been dead long enough for blood to settle in her back. Then someone came, did this post-mortem incision, and then rolled her over and put her on her stomach. The bottom line is we felt it was part of the series, uh, ultimately, uh, that this was part of the evolutionary progress of this, this killer, that now he was coming back and engaging in some post-mortem mutilation. What's going on with all this mutilation? I mean, we didn't see that before. For us, it was, it was kind of a depressing day. First Assistant DA Charles Siragusa is working the case with Rochester PD. I think if there was a low point in this investigation, it was that Thanksgiving day when the body of June Stout was discovered. It was a cold day. Really, there were no solid leads on who the individual might be. And I think everyone involved in the investigation was apprehensive that the person might never um, be apprehended or discovered. But as the killer's behavior becomes bolder and more confident, profiler Greg McCrary senses a breakthrough in the investigation. The bad news is we're having more homicides, there's more stuff going on. The good news is he's giving us more behavior to work with, uh, and he's becoming overconfident. Uh, and every day his confidence builds. He murders, he gets away with it. Uh, he begins to think of himself as invulnerable, invincible. And the good news with that is that he's not, and that he'll make a mistake. And he only has to make one mistake. In December 1989, Greg McCrary presents his profile of the killer to Rochester police. We felt that this was um, probably a white male, lived and worked in the Rochester area. We felt that maybe one of the motivating things could be that he was unable to perform. And then whose fault would that be? Well, not his, her. He's killing them, uh, and they're terrified, yet he has no trouble getting victims. How is that? How can that be? And the answer is that he's a regular customer. Hey, baby. Want a date? And they're not afraid to get in the car with him. It's just that some nights, this goes terribly bad. We felt that he was extraordinarily ordinary. He was right in front of everybody, in front of the, the uh, prostitutes, his potential victims, in front of the police, and nobody saw him. Everybody's looking for a monster out there, uh, when in fact most of these guys are not monsters uh, in, in that regard. They um, walk and talk and act a lot like the rest of us do. Not everyone in Rochester PD is convinced that McCrary's detailed profile will be any use. Being a career law enforcement guy, I can tell you there's a sort of a bias against anything psychological. And that was what I found in Rochester. We had some people wanted, who wanted this there, some people who weren't sure what we were going to do, uh, and then other people who felt that this was just a complete, uh, complete waste of time. But McCrary is convinced his profile holds the key to the killer's identity. He believes the killer will return to mutilate his victims, just as he had done with June Stott. For this reason, McCrary urges the police to increase aerial surveillance of the Genesee River area. Where would you logically search? Where he's dumping bodies. You allow his behavior to guide our investigation. He was dumping in streams and waterways, so let's look there. 
As police helicopters patrol the skies, prostitutes continue to work the streets below, despite the presence of a killer amongst them. They were more concerned about that $20 that was going to get that heroin fix or that cocaine fix or the alcohol, whatever they, need, whatever they needed. They were more concerned about getting that than about their safety. Sometimes even families can't get through to them. 24-year-old Darlene Trippy has fallen into a life of drug abuse. Darlene's sister, Pamela Warboys, fears for her safety as more girls go missing. People who are using drugs, they usually distance themselves from their families. If she was into prostitution, of course I want to say and think in my heart, no, but it's a good possibility she was. On the 13th of December, I talked to her about what was going on. And I said to her, Darlene, there's a maniac out there. And she said, don't worry, I'm fine. And I said, okay, so just be careful. That was my last conversation with her. Two days later, Darlene Trippy disappears. I think I knew then that she was dead. Every time the phone rang, you know, we'd all just hold our breath, hoping it was her. I knew. I don't think anybody else in the family did, but I knew that she was gone. Investigators William Barnes and Leonard Borriello redouble their efforts to persuade prostitutes to stay at home. On the 17th of December, they speak to June Cicero, one of the toughest girls on Lake and Lyle. So are we going to do something or what, honey? I ain't cut all night. We uh, told her to go home. And she said, no, she said, I'm working, I'm making a lot of money tonight, I'm not going to go home. We said, June, listen, just go home tonight. We figured that 15 minutes after we pulled away from her corner, the serial killer grabbed her. She was gone. But now, thanks to Greg McCrary's profile, they have a hunch what he will do next. He was coming back and engaging in post-mortem mutilation with his victims, and in that behavior was a potential opportunity to catch this guy. The investigator's eye in the sky is John McCaffrey of the New York State Police. On the 3rd of January, 1990, he is making passes over the Genesee River, as recommended by Greg McCrary. I was looking for water and things like that where he may dispose of the body, where he was comfortable. And that was in the profile the FBI had done. And it was approximately one minute away from Northampton Park that I saw a body underneath the bridge. It was at that time that I saw the car. The passenger door was open. And the car proceeded to leave the area. So we followed the car. under the bridge is June Cicero. She has been dead for over two weeks and like June Stott she has been mutilated. McCaffrey radios a trooper on the ground to stop the mysterious car and to question the driver. The intent was to identify him, uh, find out why he was there. There were a lot of coincidences. The driver is a local food factory worker and Vietnam veteran called Arthur Shawcross. He agrees to talk to the police. We wanted time to know more about who we were dealing with. 
he was cooperative. He was never in custody. Uh, he was free to go. And the more the police find out about the dark past of Arthur Shawcross, the more suspicious they become. We found out that he'd been arrested twice before for murder. Uh, young kids up in Watertown, New York. Young, young kids. In May 1972, Arthur Shawcross lured 10-year-old Jack Blake into some woods and murdered him. Four months later, on the 4th of September, eight-year-old Karen Ann Hill was visiting Watertown with her parents when Shawcross raped and killed her and dumped the body. Shawcross was sentenced to 25 years in jail but paroled after 15 on the advice of prison psychiatrists. In March 1987, the parole board settled him and his girlfriend, Rose Wally, in Rochester. But the police had not come across his name in their sweep of paroled murderers living in the city. The parole board had originally tried to settle Shawcross and Rose Wally in the towns of Binghamton and then Delhi in New York State but local residents had physically chased them out of each town when they learned of his past. In desperation, the board sent them to Rochester. I think the thing about the parole board is they wanted to ditch him somewhere to get him out of uh, their way. And I think they just said, well, let's take this guy and put him somewhere. And they brought him up here and they hit him. And this time, they decided to keep his arrival secret. As the child killer begins a new life in Rochester, even the police don't know he's in the town. How did I feel about it? That's what they did. I can't get angry. Um, it's just, that's what happened. Things happen, and you just got to work around it. FBI profiler Greg McCrary is convinced Shawcross fits his profile of the killer. This guy now is uh, on parole for a double homicide. My experience has been is that when you put these guys in prison, it's just like putting them on hold uh, for a period of time. And then when they get out, they pick up exactly where they, they, they left off. Boy, this is great news. I mean, this is exactly who we think would be responsible for this. Some experts consider killing children and killing adults to be two very different crimes, unlikely to be committed by the same offender. But in the case of Arthur Shawcross, McCrary sees a possible connection. I think the commonality is, is simply the vulnerability of the victims, that these are easy victims to get. The kids follow them, they want to go fishing with them. And prostitutes are easy victims, if you will, they get in the car with anybody. The violent past of Arthur Shawcross suggests this man could be the killer. But the police need concrete evidence if they're to make a conviction stick. If you were asking law enforcement for their hunches, most probably would have said, yeah, this guy's a good bet. But hunches don't equate with a legal requirement. There's still a lot of work for the police to do. With no forensic evidence, everything depends on getting Shawcross to confess. You need anything, Art? A cup of coffee? No. Leonard Borriello of Rochester Police go fishing, and Dennis Blythe of New York State Police are given the task of interviewing Shawcross. You've been arrested, Art? Yeah. Once. Two kids died. How did you hit him, Art? Did you use a weapon? I hit him with this. And what about the girl, Art? I choked her. You know, I knew in my own mind, I says, I, I was positive that he was the killer. And I said, gee, you know, a lot of people are going to be disappointed if we don't get a confession. Me like me. <laughs> but if the police can't get a confession from Shawcross, they will have to let him go. He will be free to prowl the streets of Rochester again. January 1990. Police in Rochester, New York, are interviewing 44-year-old Arthur Shawcross. They suspect he is a serial killer who has murdered 11 women over the last two years.
The interview was critical. There was no smoking gun. There was nothing that linked him directly to these crimes. It was circumstantial at that point. So getting him to admit to even one of these things would be a huge, huge event. You treat a, you know, a suspect, you know, with, uh, with kid gloves. I mean, you, you want to be friendly with him. You want to assist him and, you know, show him that you're friendly. Uh, let him see his girlfriend. Let him see his wife. Does he want coffee? Does he want something to eat? I mean, you know, basically you're his friend. Or let him believe that you're his friend. You go fishing, Art? Yeah. I like to fish, sure. Yeah. Where do you like to fish, Art? Up on Lake Ontario? No. Lake Ontario's dead. Everybody knows that. The investigators decide to push Shawcross on their strongest lead. Elizabeth Gibson, who was seen getting into the car of a man called Mitch, hours before her death. The police track down Barb, the prostitute who made the sighting. She immediately confirms the man in the interview room is the man she knows as Mitch. I talked to Investigator Blythe and I told him, I says, let's go for the Liz Gibson confession first. I says, we have all the information in the world. That's our best case. We get that, then we've got the rest of the day to get the rest. You did Liz Gibson, didn't you? No, I didn't. Come on, Art, don't bullshit us. We know you did. I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> Come on, Art, it's all over. We know. Bard saw you with Gibson. You were seen with that woman 11 hours before she shows up dead. Is that a coincidence? Is that what you're yeah, trying to yeah, tell us? Yeah, coincidence. Come on, Art, we know it's you. Now, we treated you well, right? Why are you guys fucking with me? All right, Art, calm down. Confronting Shawcross hasn't worked. The investigators need to come up with a new tactic and quick. Dennis Blythe remembers Shawcross had seemed concerned about Clara Neal, a woman with whom he is having an affair and whose car he was driving when he was taken in. That car of yours, Art? Who drives that car apart from you? Think about it. We all know the car belongs to Clara. And we hate to think Clara was involved in this. Tell me specifically, was Clara involved in this? No. She's in involved. Which is a huge statement, meaning she's not, but Perhaps I am, and then that was the tipping point. At that point, I, I don't think he had any choice. Okay. Then why don't you tell us about Liz Gibson? We know this is hard, Art. We know. I killed her. After he admitted killing a Liz Gibson, we knew we had our serial killer in custody. It is the first of ten confessions. He went through the pictures uh, like he was going through a deck of cards, throwing the pictures of the girls that he was responsible for killing in one pile, and the other ones that he wasn't responsible for in another pile. Yeah, her. Yeah, her too. Yeah. We came out of the interview room. Yeah. And everybody was crying. Yeah, her. We were just so proud to have this guy in custody and he wouldn't be able to hurt anybody else. One of the murders he confesses to is Darlene Trippy. She was killed um, December 15th of 89 and found in January of 1990. So in a way, I consider my family if you can call us lucky. There were some families that went years, years and years without knowing what happened to their loved one. And luckily, we didn't have to suffer that long. At his trial in November 1990, Shawcross blames his crimes on post-traumatic stress disorder, the result of horrific experiences in the Vietnam War. Michael Stone is a psychologist who interviewed Shawcross about these experiences. His stories uh, all involve uh, heroic exploits uh, like you would see in, in some B-movie. 
And the one he told me, for example, there was a girl with a belt of grenades around her, and he managed to, you know, subdue her and, and behead her and stick her head on a post, uh, you know, as if a warning to the others, you know, don't mess with me. But Shawcross saw no combat in Vietnam at all. He was only responsible for handing out uniforms to other soldiers. Whilst Shawcross's stories are not true, they provide insight into his state of mind. His exploits in Vietnam focus on women and has the quality of portraying him as a superman. You ain't seen roughly. And a superman, you know, who is by no means above uh, wreaking vengeance on women that, as we would say, may have, quotes done him wrong. Shawcross's lurid stories do not convince the jury. I think that pointed up that his claims about these experiences in Vietnam were exaggerated and were designed to coincide and convince the jury that he was insane with respect to the Rochester homicides. Members of the jury, how do you tell me the matter of the people of the state of New York versus Arthur Shawcross? Arthur Shawcross is found guilty of 10 murders. Later, he pleads guilty to an 11th. He is sentenced to at least 250 years in jail. As much as justice can be done, and I would tell, I told any of the survivors of the victims in this case, the best we can do is see the justice, whatever that means, the justice occurs. And I think in the case of Arthur Shawcross, the verdict was a just verdict. The new science of profiling has proved vital in building a picture of the killer. There is satisfaction when, when you're right about the majority of things that you say, but I think the, the greatest satisfaction is to feel that you may have played a, a small role in getting this guy off the street. Since Shawcross's conviction, profiling has become central to homicide investigations. I don't want to overstate what a profile does or the impact it has, uh, but I don't want to understate it either. It has a place, I think, in an investigation like this, but ultimately the credit belonged to the frontline investigators. The nightmare is over with as far as we're concerned. You had a closure, which is good for these victims' families. Because you got to remember, these girls, no matter, no matter what, these girls are somebody's wives or sisters or daughters. They got family. Arthur Shawcross is just an evil, evil person. He took something precious away from every single one of us. This is a guy who's not crazy. He's just just bad. There's no pill that can fix these guys. And uh, the only thing we can do to protect ourselves from these guys is simply to lock them up, to get rid of them, to separate them from the rest of us. That's the only way we can keep ourselves safe from somebody like Art Shawcross. Arthur Shawcross died in November 2008. 